This uh, morning, I want to enact, make some announcements. You know, there's going to be a special musical event in the library this afternoon, and all of those contributing their talent have been long friends of the society. Uh, most of them have been professionals, and we believe we'll have a pleasant afternoon, and the uh, benefits from it will go to the advancement of the publication program of our society. So we hope that you will be present, if possible. I'd also like to make an announcement to the effect that a few weeks ago, my wife and I made a, t a tape in connection with the dinner to the advancement of her work. The number of people have asked for this tape in which I give a short talk on bacon and she on the work of the Baconian idea in American life and government. And we have a few of these which are available. People have asked for them. They can be secured through the gift shop or ordered through the gift shop. Many people have asked to secure copies of this particular tape. In connection with our recent book on uh, alchemy, which has just been published, I have a rather nice announcement I can make that I think is uh, a good sign in the right direction, namely that among the first to order the book, was the Smithsonian Institution. And the second order, a few days later, came from the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Now, how either of them knew about it, we don't know. But it looks as though it's getting around. <laughs> so this morning, we have a nice problem uh, in the effort to find ways of reducing uh, the human equation in, in uh, health, where it is damaged by attitudes or by uh, negative thinking, or by the pressure of problems. Uh, long ago, Plato made the statement that all forms of government are satisfactory, suitable, and proper if they are honestly administered. That if the best rule and the rest obey, we have a proper commonwealth. He said that a good king was better than a, a bad dictator, and a, a good dictator better than a bad uh, politician. All of these things are rather summed up to integrity. Now, the Neoplatonists took this problem a little further, namely that the only ultimate, ultimate government that is going to solve our problems is self-government. We are going to have to do it for ourselves. And it is good to notice that this time particularly, that all over the country and in many parts of the world outside of this area, efforts are being made for in, for, by individuals to do things for themselves, to correct the mistakes of leadership, to repair the damage of selfishness, and to overcome the consequences of ignorance. These processes are very encouraging. In fact, it's probably true to say that the present moment is one of the best that we've gone through in a long time, although to most people it is maybe one of the worst. It is the best because at last more and more people are beginning to think. They are beginning to realize that legislation will not result in integrity. Integrity comes with the individual himself. And after a while we not only find the people ruling themselves, but the person ruling himself. The directives for such rulership, of course, arise from personal experience, from tradition, from the spiritual institutions of mankind, from the ancient philosophies, arts, and sciences, but most of all, from an interpretation of these values, by means of which they become part of a strong moral perspective on life. Now, when we come down to the individual, we find his condition very much mirrors the social situation of today. The society in which we live is seriously disturbed, and this disturbance is reflected in the attitudes of people. <clears throat> more and more, the individual is taking on the negative values or lack of them, which are bothering us today. And out of all this comes fear, 
anxiety, uh, objection, uh, even violence. And all of these excesses react into the human being himself. I think the Oriental attitude was probably the best available. Namely, that the great problem is the individual learning to smooth out his own conduct, to find ways in which he can overcome or transmute the pressures which disturb him. One way, of course, of accomplishing this is to realize the reason why we are in trouble. To realize that we're in trouble because it is the only way in which the individual can be lured from his own mistakes. We are in trouble because we deserve them. All the troubles that we have are part of a, what the Oriental calls a karmic load. Now, karma is not a fatal punishment. Karma is simply the fact that when you do it wrong, we must be corrected. When we make a mistake, we must find for certain that we have made a mistake. And most of all, we must stop blaming our mistakes on other people. Most persons today will feel or say that they would be happy if it wasn't for something someone else was doing. Well, each of us has to finally realize that we cannot prevent what someone else is doing. But we can transmute the entire circumstance so that it can no longer damage ourselves. It does not mean that we have to accept the mistakes of others. But it does mean that we must try to understand them and find how to adapt the knowledge we gain from experience to the preservation of our own well-being. Health problems today uh, are perhaps more serious than ever before. In spite of the nu numerous advancements in science, in spite of infinite research and continuous development of remedial agencies, the public health is not good. The public health is bad because of the tensions and stresses by which the person is influenced. In religion for a long time, uh, we had a strong line of defense against this. The individual, regardless of what church or faith he belonged to, tried to live what he claimed to believe. He tried to prove to himself and others that he was under the leadership of a spiritual integrity. When he read in the New Testament, uh, that Jesus admonished us all to be brethren, to unite in common cooperation. He tried to do this. But today, this type of thing is no longer a, as meaningful as it should be. We, are, we know that we should not be cruel, that we should not be selfish, that we should not uh, uh, kill or destroy these things we accept upon the basis of our religious convictions. And about three-quarters of the Earth's populations have convictions to this effect. Yet never before has there been more war and disturbance. And in the individual life, never more ha before has there been so much pressure, so many frustrated ambitions, and so many mistakes carefully and lovingly nourished. The, uh, the situation, therefore, is that our religion is not, at this time, serving as an actual preventive of disorders. When we uh, claim to be a Christian, the theory is that we shall obey the teachings of Christ. The acceptance of the fact that they are good is of very little practical value, unless this acceptance involves our definite dedication to fulfilling these uh, statements. If we do really believe that we should love one another, then the fact that we are baptized or converted into a certain faith does not permit us to keep on disliking everybody in the name of God. We do not have the right to claim a religion that we do not practice. 
and we do not practice a religion unless it does something to change us for the better. Therefore, we have all over the world devout religious people who are not getting any better. In fact, they are getting a little worse. They're using their religion as a very powerful defense, and for their religion they are willing to die. But for their religion they are not willing to live. And this is a very sad state of affairs. But out of it comes the inev inevitable conclusion that the religion was the more important factor. No matter what we claim to believe, we are what we do. We are the standard of living by which we seek to face the problems of life. Actually, the temptations that affect, affect us and burden us today are largely personal selfishness, grudges, and all kinds of negative attitudes that have no justification in any religion or philosophy worthwhile. Yet we do not have the skill or the wisdom or the strength to live what we believe. Back in the days when my esteemed grandmother was growing up, the problem was much simpler. She came from Massachusetts and uh, was brought up in, in the mystical atmosphere of the New England Transcendentalists. These uh, rather gentle people, like Thoreau and Emerson, had a very simple way of life, but they kept it. In the community in which she grew up, Haverhill, Massachusetts, uh, people did not have to fight their neighbors to maintain their integrity. The neighbor had the same integrity as themselves. The individual who was uncomfortable was the one who failed to live the level of the integrities of the community. At that time, people were naturally inclined to be kind. They went to church, they tried to practice what they heard, and they also served each other in a thousand gentle and kindly ways. All this has been changed. Today, the individual finds very little support from his personal environment. His friends, his relatives, his neighbors are all under the same pressures as himself, and they are all living to compromise their conduct to meet the advantages of profit. All this type of thing makes the person more alone. Instead of society supporting him, he now has to support society. Instead of being controlled, directed, and inspired by reasonable conduct around him, he is forced to try and maintain some kind of a reasonable conduct in the face of constant pressure. Out of this constant pressure comes a negative psychology. The individual gradually undermines his own life. He becomes more and more aware of the delinquencies of the time. He becomes more and more frustrated and unable to cope with a situation which he should never have been expected to face. This business of trying to make people of moderate integrity face incredible temptations is not reasonable or right. But it is so. It is the way it is. And each person has to either expect to follow the general pattern and suffer with the rest, or else he must attempt to live his own life constructively and let some of the others work it out for themselves. It is almost useless to try to convert other people. The individual who is susceptible to conversion generally is already well on the way to a better life. Those who do not agree, we can't do very much about. Conformity is not what we desire. We cannot solve this problem by all joining the same church. We cannot form it or answer it by having all people vote for the same candidates. The problem lies in the individual working out the reason why he does not feel good at this time. If he has headaches, backaches, and all kinds of symptoms which arise from the vagueness of his own attitudes, there is no way that health can be improved unless the individual recognizes the therapy of his own personal integrity. Until he is, accepts this and understands it, he is going to suffer from a series of vague 
conditions. Conditions of worry, anxiety, argumentativeness. He's going to look in the newspaper and see nothing but the trouble. He's going to listen to the television and become more discontented and feel less able to cope. All of these things have to be handled by the person himself. But this was the reason he was put here in the first place. The individual was not put here to lean back and let someone else save him. We are here as a creation of creatures, and we have to work out our own salvation with diligence. We have to recognize that we are here to grow and not simply to have fun. Because if we do not grow, there will be nothing in the, la in the last analysis that is either funny or enjoyable. We are here to improve ourselves, correct our own mistakes, help where we can, and stand strong against the temptations to negative attitudes which so many people suffer from today. Even if we are successful in this, however, we will not be able to completely dispense with psychology or psychiatry. We will still need them. But we will get rid of the individual who is simply making himself sick by his own wrong approaches to life. Now we are all reading the newspapers and uh, we are seeing the dismal situation that is developing. We are also observing a certain note of desperation arising in the upper echelons of human society. We are realizing that nations and communities, vast areas and small areas, are beginning to recognize that the change must be made by the individual, that we must grow. We can never pay any politician enough money so that he can grow for us. We have to do it ourselves. And the more pressure we have, the more we will be tempted to do it right. In the old days, when temptations were low and uh, not too many of them, any definite minor variety of breakaway from normalcy was considered uh, forgivable and forgettable. Today, this is no longer the case. Today, the problem must be faced directly. We have people all the time who are worried. And we have people all the time who are going more and more into a negative reaction. And we also have another large group of people, enlarging considerably, that are rushing around in one direction or another for a panacea for all this. They are trying to find some way of getting out of trouble without changing themselves. Or that they can get on a boat that is going somewhere, but they are not the captain. This also is a very dismal failure. There is simply no way in which somebody else can make us strong unless we are willing to try. There's no way that we can find a philosophy of life that is adequate to our needs unless we are willing to live it. There's no, no longer any way in which we can join our way into security. We have to do it ourselves. With this in mind, then there are a few recommendations that might be useful to us at this time. The first place we should add up and search out the situation we're in. Find out what kind of attitudes we have in general. Are we by nature optimistic or by nature pessimistic? When I say optimistic, I mean is there a deep abiding hope that is available under pressure and stress? Or are we those who are just waiting for the worse to get a little worser? Are we waiting every day for more bad news? And when it comes, sit back in a sad smile and say, I knew it. <laughs> we, are we really uh, people who want to do something? Or are we overwhelmed by the negation of things and decided that there's no hope? Well, there is always hope, and nature is so constituted that when an individual gets rid of all hopes, then nature slowly eliminates him and gives him a new chance later to improve his attitudes. But the world will not redeem itself, or peace will not descend upon us until the world itself unites in an effort to achieve it. 
and in this effort to achieve it, all good progress begins with the individual. Enough individuals make a certain move or assume a certain fact, society changes. It is not changed from the top, really. It is changed from the common, average person who is the most uncommon and miraculous of all creatures. If you have the tendency, therefore, to expect the worst, this you should start to work on as quickly as possible. I know people who have found a one very simple cure for much of this. They have done it by a kind of retrospection. Always expecting the worst, it has been suggested to some of them that they sit down quietly and re look back over their own lives for over a period of years and find out just exactly what did happen to them. Uh, is this knowing of despair and despondency the, really the result of a tragic life or has it been simply an attitude which has chosen to ignore all good things and cling unto the ills? Can anyone really look back over a lifetime and not find many things that happened to them that were beautiful, helpful, constructive, and useful? Can we all look back over a period of time and find no friend who was ever any good? Or, and if we did find this situation, have we really analyzed why? If we are friendless, is it because we have never been a friend rather than never had one? If we are friendless, have we had one or two disappointments and then turned against the whole world? Also, if we look through this background, we may find a great many things that can be capitalized in terms of progress. We can learn to value the experiences we have had. We can discover what happened when we were over gullible. We can find what happened when we lost our temper and made a bad situation worse. We can find out when we were cheated and maybe discover in the quietude of our own lives that that happened because we wanted something that wasn't right or reasonable in the first place. All of these types of reflections will help us to find out what kind of a background in our lives could be held responsible for our present attitudes. Now, there probably will be a tragedy or two all the way along. There will never be a time when things do not at least occasionally go wrong. But looking back over a period of 40, 50, 60, 70 years, it would seem that we should, re we should find that we are reading a book, a biography, or an autobiography, and that up to a certain point we have always made this book unreliable. We have always emphasized what has been done to us and not what we did to them. We have always taken the joy out of our own lives and then blame someone else for it. But out of this uh, careful reconsideration of our own conduct, we may very often find a new textbook, a new way of looking at things that can be tremendously helpful. Now this is the reason for history on the larger scale of things. Today we are looking around and we see mostly history of war and pillage and we look back upon war and pillage to the beginning when the cave people threw stones at each other. But we have also done some very wonderful things which we lose sight of. We lose sight of the tremendous progresses that we have made in a great many fields of action. We realize what has happened in health, for example that the average length of life back 2,000 years was around 30 years of life. Finally, we got it up in the 10th, 12th, and 11th century to 35 years. In the 18th and 17th centuries, we got it close to 60. Now the records give us more than 70, and it is increasing all the time. Many great diseases have been curbed. Many types of misunderstanding have been smoothed out. We are beginning to be interested in diet, nutrition, all of these things, all of which have 
old foundations but have been generally ignored. Those who ignore the lessons of the past most quickly are the ones who have the most powerful opportunities and privileges at the present time. It's useless, however, to assume that we are successful because of a wealth which permits us to die of gluttony. These things have to be measured. But in measuring them, we can also measure what philosophy has done for us. And we can observe the slow decline of it. How year after year, century after century, human stupidity and avarice has gradually blocked the course of normal mentation. We can see time after time how virtue was sacrificed to ambition. And little by little, we can see the consequences of it. We see one empire after another go down. We find one civilization after another fail, almost always because of corruption. Nearly always we realize something that architecture has taught us, namely, the history is a continuing account of lost ground. The longer we go back, the better it was. The more we come forward, the worse it gets. On the grounds, of course, that greater opportunity to be better today that was ever available before, as it made it possible for us to be worse. Now, out of this, we have the people with uh, various ailments. Now, actually, the ancients had quite a good idea of what was wrong with sick people. One of the uh, most uh, interesting of the older healers was Hippocrates of Kos. And he uh, was the one who created what we call today the clinic. He was the first one to make a systematic study of the causes of disease. Also in Egypt, there was a priest who lived about a thousand years B.C. who did a work on the study of human health and uh, wrote, left behind him a papyrus, the medical papyrus that uh, was uh, translated and brought into uh, popular circulation only a few years ago. This old document uh, describes ailments, how to treat them, what to do with them. But Hippocrates perhaps was the most successful. When they came to him sick, uh, they gathered in the chapel of Asclepius, the god of healing, a great figure standing uh, with a coiled serpent around a staff, which was a symbol of medicine, and the dog crouching at his feet the symbol of the service of mankind. And when they got there, the sick people were put on cots and told to sleep for the, the first night in the temple. And they were to record the dreams that they had or any experiences or memories that came to them which were dominant and treasurable. And in the morning, the physicians analyzed these reports and upon this basis accomplished a great deal in the correction of human illness. The dream psychology told uh, Hippocrates the secret attitudes of the people. And where these secret attitudes were bad, help had to suffer. So that help was not necessarily merely in the dosing of the sick. It was in the cultivating of a proper relationship between the individual the world in which he lived, and the divine power that governs it. Hippocrates was among the first to point out that all healing actually and inevitably comes from God. The physician is merely the servant of deity. What deity proclaims and decrees, the, serv the servant can fulfill. And Hippocrates was very certain that God gave his best help to those who most deserved it and that he was the one that decided who deserved it. And this desert, well, the deserving was dependent upon character and conduct. So Hippocrates said in many instances that it was necessary for the person to change his ways. And this is always a stumbling block. We will change anything except our ways. <laughs> We will do anything we're expected to do as long as it doesn't change anything that we're doing now. <laughs> we see this in the narcotics problem. You see it in alcoholism. You see it where legislators get out 
and defend the right of the individual to get drunk. We want better laws, but they must not interfere with what people want to do. And if people want to destroy themselves, we should never create laws to prevent this. And if we do create laws, they are almost impossible to enforce because the person is determined to do what he pleases. And the only final answer, as philosophy has pointed out, is that we, he must come to the point where he pleases to do that which is right. This is the only answer to most of the physical and emotional disorders of mankind. We cannot say to the individual successfully that he must do that which he will not willingly do. Perhaps we can force him to do it. We may be able to restrict him so that he has no choice but to do it. But when this happens, he becomes neurotic. Because the neurotic is when a person who can't do what he wants to do because he shouldn't. And this combination is almost beyond conflict. We can do very little about it. But we must try to find ways in which the person desires to do that which is best. Now, several circumstances uh, come into that. Uh, the individual who is desperately ill and is so uncertain about his survival very often has quite a streak of virtue appear in his nature. He is willing to do almost anything to get well. If the doctor tells him that he's got to change his diet, he'll promise. If he has told that he has a de definitely difficult disposition, he will agree and he will swear that he will do something about it immediately. But he's told that he shouldn't keep his mind on his business while he's dying in his hospital bed, he will assure the physician that he has had no further interest in money because he knows he's behind and beyond the case of where he can do anything about it. But the doctor watches carefully and the first day that there is an improvement in the physical condition of the patient. He wants a copy of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> he's right back doing the things he's always done. As soon as there is hope, he will break the rules. When there seems to be no hope, he will keep the rules for a short time. Now, society is in, doing, in the much the same situation. When society is as bad off as it is here now in the world, it will promise almost anything. But as soon as it feels a little better, it will order its equivalent to the Wall Street Journal. It will go right back to what it wants to do. Confucius made this uh, observation years ago in China that the individual is in some mysterious way so dominated by his own will that he will continue in his course even if it leads to his own destruction. We find, uh, for instance, nowadays, a lot of emphasis on diets. Diets are a dozen a, dozen a dollar, but all of these diets put together accomplish very little permanent result. The individual finally gives up trying because it is too difficult upon him or in case unwisely done, it is too dangerous. But all the way along the way, we are constantly tempted to do the things that we shouldn't do. And as many of these things are glamorous and apparently pleasant, we are almost certain to compromise our principles. Now then, uh, here is another phase of it. If the present television programs are not sufficient to create neurosis, they will continue until they do. We will find that more and more intelligent people are turning off the sets. This is a sign of a slowly emerging maturity. It is an indication that the individual is realizing to some degree that what he is watching is influence, influence his thoughts, his emotions, and his attitudes toward life. He's also beginning to realize that his children are being very adversely conditioned. And yet to pass a law to prevent this type of thing, and everyone nearly would vote against it. This is the type of problem we have in personal life. 
to try to make something work quietly, consistently, and intelligently. Some time ago, a group of people came together for a very interesting experiment. They were old friends and all knew each other. And each one was told to make a statement of what he considered to be the most detrimental factor in the life of one of the others. There were no names were put on. It was confidential. But each person finally had someone that told him why he was wrong. That worked pretty well. well. I knew one of the members of that little group. They said I had a wonderful time. Of course, nobody paid any attention to it. <laughs> they just kept on doing as they had been doing. And if they'd known who said it, there would have been an unpleasant relationship. <laughs> but because nobody knew, it was all fun. But the truth of the matter was, many valuable suggestions were made, but they weren't followed. So start out some morning in the day as you go along and see how you handle the day. See how long you can go without fretting or without being interrupted in something you've considered terribly important. Or that you don't have an argument over the price of something. That you don't re open a paper and find the world so bad you can hardly stand it. Or that you go out and everyone is cheating you and go on through until you finally catch up with relatives and relations and have even worse times with them. <laughs> Keep on going through the day and see what, have you have, what you have actually accomplished in the way of smoothing out your own inner life. It was said by the Chinese that the wise men of old slept without dreams, and this was exactly what is meant. All these pressures finally come through into the subconscious and either come out through dream symbolism or out through character or body disorders. So see what you can know, notice. See whether you are always expecting the worst and that you are desperately surprised if it doesn't happen. In fact, a little disappointed because when you expect something and it doesn't happen, in a sense it is a, an indictment of your own judgment and people don't like that. But try to see what would happen if you could go through all these problems without being moved, without being discouraged, without being excited or irritated. The phone rings and it's the wrong number. That would be a chance to be irritated. But don't be irritated. You get a, a letter which is unpleasant or you get a bill that you don't think you owe, or something of that kind, and more tension, more stress. And yet all the things that we consider to be dishonorable, and which we want to do something about, we can meet and handle without one single heave of the inner life. We can do it in a simple, matter-of-fact, reasonable way, without building any type of attitude. We can meet dishonesty with a simple attitude of realization that it is so, but no emotional stress. That we can try to solve problems with clear judgment and calm thinking, but without emotional excitement, fatigue, or worry. Things that are worth worrying about will not be changed by worry. Therefore, worries have to be faced quietly and solved. And there should be no overjudgment. We should never condemn ourselves constantly for something or condemn other people. We should look into our marriages and our relationships with our children and see just exactly what the background motivations are. Are we motivated by, the, by selfishness? Are we a see seeking escape from responsibility? If we are always looking to get away from the responsibilities of living and living only in an atmosphere of eternal opportunities, we'll be in trouble. Everything has its price. Happiness must be deserved. All the things that we want that are real and good, we must justly require because we deserve them, never because we want them. Our desires are beyond number, but our needs are few. So we uh, gradually can 
get past this point, which especially in older years has a tendency to close in and interfere with health. The individual may live a long time, by the way, with a bad disposition. I've seen it happen. <laughs> but it was, it was not much of a success. They simply prolonged their own grudge against some humanity. They only kept on being sorry for themselves and, and it lasted a few long years of that attitude when they would probably have been happier if they hadn't lived. They would have been much better if they'd gone at a reasonable age. But old age is an opportunity for philosophical consideration of values. It is an opportunity for the improvement of the inner life. And it is a continuing opportunity to learn and to grow. But if these factors are missing, then it is simply a burden. But the Lord arranged it that way because if people do not do what is right, whatever they do must be a burden. This type of thinking can work. It has come to the West as, uh, quite a bit through Zen, which has been an oriental philosophy of quietude, a philosophy that s discovers realities, in a sense, by the humor of life, by the realization that so many of these terrible disasters are really funny if you can get away from your own ego. Many things that seem to us to be inevitable and terribly important fade entirely from the consciousness of a good Zen man. <coughs> Zen is a, a quietude, a living smoothly through life, a living in which there is no rejection of duty, but duty no longer becomes a burden, it becomes a fulfillment. And an individual who serves with fretting and with the re reservations and considers himself underprivileged because his burdens are too heavy is simply losing the most, the most beautiful opportunity for growth that there is. The heavier the burden, the greater the opportunity to grow. Growth does not come from lying down like the old hymn says and floating off to heaven on flowery beds of ease. It, com it comes from hard work well done. If we can learn to like nature, we can have a much better time of it. Now, in the West, religion has gradually drifted away from responsibility. You very seldom see a, an, a, an article on re modern religion that really gets down to the, the very heart of the matter. You very seldom hear a preacher who really gives an, an, an important sermon that has to do with people living up to their convictions if they have them. These things seem to fade away. And now, uh, membership in various religions is largely a socialist, uh, a social uh, relationship. It is that the individual joins others who find a, an intelligent or attractive preacher and uh, attend that church. But the real living of it is not given the thought that it should. And the vicarious atonement is just about as bad, if not worse. The individual is not relieved from the responsibility of his mistakes simply by acknowledging them. He must correct them. He must be able to prove that in every way he has sought to remove from his life that which is discrediting to himself or his environment. If the person keeps on worrying long enough, they have a series of problems that can become very unpleasant. It is a very not common cause of nearly all chronic ailments. Chronic being something that represents a chronic factor in the disposition. The afflicted people have often recognized, and more often should have, that this chronic problem arises from unchangeable and inflexible attitudes that are wrong. It is the result of living a life with a wrong, basic pattern of existence. And, and, of course, this is becoming more common all the time, with education failing entirely to emphasize the importance of integrities in life. Everything now is to get there quick, make money fast, and run a computer. Without these great gracious factors, life is unimportant. Actually, education is not doing what it should. It is not helping a person to realize that he is responsible 
for his own conduct. An education that gives no inspiration undoubtedly weakens character and gradually brings the individual down to ruin. So we have to take over the, all these problems ourselves. We have to take them over in any way and every way that we can. We take them over sometimes in prayerfulness in which we ask divine strength for the changes that we should make in ourselves. Prayerfulness is, however, not very effective if it is not accompanied by a distinct and defi definite effort to achieve the improvement that we believe to be necessary. Deity helps those that help themselves. And the individual who is trying and striving in the name of truth will be sustained and supported by truth. But unless there is a dedication to the improvement of a situation, nothing changes. Chronic ailments very often slow down the patterns of life. Emotional ailments of all kinds, hates, fears, and so forth, certainly affects their circulation and cardiac activities. The individual who has a poorly organized life physically and has been subject to constant emotional stress, fears, hates, anxieties, and worries will surely have heart problems will surely have the troubles with the body, trying to live through the mistakes of the dweller therein. To dwell in the body is a burden upon the spirit. But the body is never really to blame. The body is simply an, an overcoat. It's simply a vehicle that we use for an adjustment in the material world. The body, in and of itself, is a very natural, healthy, kindly thing. But by the time we afflict it for generation after generation, and by heredity inherit a mass of delinquencies, the body comes to be uneasy. Now, no medicine can really correct this, because almost every medicine has to destroy some function. It has to slow down the, wor the worries by slowing down the thinking. And this is not the good answer. The individual, having inherited a body that has some aptitudes and some abilities, can consider himself to be a small god ruling over a little universe which is himself. Now, it's not such a small universe, if you want to consider it correctly. There are more life units in the average human body than there are living things on the earth. One body. Millions and billions of living units that must work together for the salvation of the body. Over this is God. God in this case being the self that inhabits the body. This self has all kinds of privileges and opportunities. It can be a good and conscientious leader serving wisely and lovingly the needs of the body. It can be a good master of builders and workers. It can be a great inspiration it can regulate the conduct of the body so that it never becomes involved in dangerous pursuits. It also can prevent the individual from destroying his own body by intemperance. For intemperance is in the body of man is something like the Atlantic deluge on the face of the earth. All of the things that are necessary to our survival can be controlled and can be controlled by the master of the show. But if the self within this body is determined to use it for only the gratification of personal attitudes, if this individual will destroy rest, will lose his sense of humor, which is very dangerous, and will one way or another discourage and dissipate the body's functions, he will be sick. He will be sick because he has broken the rules that the body says it must keep. So in all the things we do in life, in business and everything else, we are constantly breaking rules. And then in the newspaper, a little later, we hear about bankruptcies and great losses and uh, various disasters to the life of the person. We also find now na natural disasters. We find, as we do today, constant references now to floods, typhoons, earthquakes, plagues, pestilences, are everywhere. And all these things together seem to add up to something. 
I know that long years ago, I'm trying to make a research project on the co correlation between earthquake phenomena and war. And there seems to be a definite relationship. Nearly always, earthquakes are associated or very closely connected with social upheavals. Why, we do not necessarily know exactly, but there is some kind of a magnetic relationship uh, between natural phenomena and the human being. I, I think this is uh, well brought out in a, a very cute little article saw on the paper not long ago that there was suddenly a complete loss of catfish in Japan. No one could buy a catfish. And when they searched into the matter a little ways, they found out that this catfish is the great Japanese, Japanese earthquake warner. Uh, the catfish is the first to know that an earthquake is going to happen. So there was a report out seismologically that the earthquake threatens and everybody went out and buys catfish. And they keep it in a little bowl at home and they feed it regularly and they watch it. And if the little catfish became, becomes very happy and flutters around in a perfectly natural way, all is well. But if it gets nervous and disturbed and jumps up and down in the tank and uh, becomes obviously distraught, the earthquake will follow in a very short time. This is perhaps something a way of judging about Earth, that nearly all nature has ways of estimating approaching earthquakes. Now, if this is true, then is it not quite possible that there is a psychic connection between emotional conduct, visible circumstances, human attitudes, and seismic disorders? If the catfish gets unhappy and an earthquake follows, then we can say, or might be able to say, when mankind becomes unhappy and confused, a war follows. Wars and pestilences seemingly are simply the outcomes of some magnetic relationship between the individual and nature. We find them always increasing, and we now find a new type of earthquake and that is terrorism. Terrorism is probably the, one of the last and ultimate forms of the proof of the failure of perspectives and circumstances. Here we have a race most highly developed in science and many other fields that is unable to correct or accomplish its own morality. These things we have to bear in mind. And while we can't do all about them, uh, all the time, we must realize that a temper fit is an earthquake in the body. We must realize that it is a highly detrimental thing, that it's something that is happening to us as a direct result of an unreasonable attitude, an unreasonable relationship with life, or the breaking of natural laws, which has forced nature which to, re to re uh, resource in trouble. We must realize all the time that plagues and pestilences arise in the body. We know what happens when the body is subjected to cocaine. We know what happens when it is subjected to marijuana. We know these things are what they are. But above everything else is the grim determination to do exactly as we please. Now most people don't go to that extreme with it. Uh, they, they will not sacrifice willingly and knowingly life or health just to do what they please. But if the individual does what he pleases and his ple what he pleases is not right, he is bound to have trouble. And no amount of flavor that is pleasant will take care of the factors that have caused the trouble. Therefore, each person must recognize that there is only one way in which he can assure himself of a maximum bodily support for his mental and emotional life. And that is, that he is a good ruler over his body, that he takes proper care of it, that he does for it that which it needs, that he does not uh, dissipate it, that he does not open himself 
to contagions and diseases simply because of callousness or indifference. That if he does not think straight, he is going to suffer. And wherever he breaks the Ten Commandments, suffering gets in there somewhere. Every nation of importance in the whole world has had its equivalent of the Ten Commandments. They represent not necessarily the will of God in words imposed upon a prophet on the crest of Sinai. The Ten Commandments are man's natural realization over a period of thousands of years that affects call, follow causes as the wheel of the cart follows the foot of the ox. Whatever we do has its natural and inevitable consequence. Therefore, we have Ten Commandments. And we also have additional commandments given by Christ. We have the Ten Commandments in China, in India, in Persia, in Egypt, in Greece, and Rome. In most cases, disregarded. And as the disregard grew greater, the countries fell. Because these inevitable rules have to be obeyed. Now, the Egyptians were a little more generous in this matter. They weren't satisfied with ten or a dozen commandments. They had what was called the negative com uh, uh, confession of faith. And it is found in the papyri of the Book of the Dead, which is more really the book of the coming forth by day. For it means it's the book that is placed with the body in the tomb when the spirit goes forth into the green valleys of Amentet. But in any event, the, the spirit has to stand before the judgment of Osiris, where the scales and the balances stand, and he must make the confession of faith. And if he, is dead, dead, if he lies or contradicts himself or misstates something, the jury of assessors, from which our jury system later came, uh, bear witness to this. And if his crimes are slight, he may be forgiven. If they are great, he must return to the world and try again. But in this confession of faith, he has to admit any fault that he has. And he also has to swear under oath as a spirit waiting for immortality, in which no longer any substitute gives any value whatsoever. He has to say, in my life, I have never hated a human being. In my life, I have dis never dishonestly dealt with a human being. In my former life, I swear that wherever there was suffering, I did all I could to help. That I owe no man anything. That I have never borrowed money at usury. That I have never failed to pay my debts. That I have never failed to worship the gods. That I have never failed to keep the peace. All of these things, up to over 100 items, must be met before the soul can go into the blessed regions. Now, this is a little extravagant, perhaps, a little more than is absolutely necessary, but it meant that way back 5,000 years ago, the condition of human life here and hereafter is based upon a code of solid integrities. These integrities are the basis of right action that the individual who has, has never failed to support his parents, who has never failed to guard and guide the lives of his children, all these things he has to witness, affirm. And the assessors who have all kinds of metaphysical eyes to see things can instantly detect any error or any falsification that he makes. So this is a, perhaps an ideal statement of Earth and its ultimate, man's destiny carried forward into the infinity. <clears throat> but the fact remains that these codes of conduct, where kept, protect nations, where broken, nations fall. The decline and fall of the Roman Empire, as set forth by Gibbon, is a good example of this. It shows how little by little a strong and upright people gradually deteriorated into luxury and dissipation and were gradually overwhelmed by barbarians who were still clean. <clears throat> we have this today, except that we are short of barbarians.
we are no longer have other tribes that are going to come in. If anything goes wrong now, it must be ourselves doing it to ourselves. But the fact remains that health, happiness, security, integrity, and a proper relationship with life demands self-discipline. It demands that we learn to do those things which are right and do them now. And uh, it's very unpleasant and disillusioning to see uh, selfishness masquerading as religion, self-interest and uh, ulterior motives uh, supported or sustained by so-called quotations from Scripture to find that the individual uses these principles not to improve himself, but in one way or another to avoid them and try to force them on others. It's absolutely necessary for this generation to find itself in a way that it can then turn to other things. The moment the individual becomes uh, integrated and no longer supports or advocates or endures the corruptions of his time. He becomes, in a sense, free. He may lose his opportunity for great wealth. He may not be the one that is promoted to the highest position. But he is the individual who is gradually changing himself into a citizen of eternity. He is a person who is living in the true universe as it is a universe of integrity, a universe of honor. He is preparing himself for infinite citizenship in an infinite plan of things. Whereas those who are not so dedicated must in due time uh, return and stay with it until they awaken to these values. Now these values are not going to all awaken at once, either even in one person. They're going to grow slowly as the individual begins to appreciate and understand his real needs. They're going to become more and more obvious to him as he grows. If he takes the first step towards self-improvement, the second step will be easier and more obvious. All the way along, he is in the position, as soon as he so desires, to realize that his time in this world is brief. And though he may return a number of times, even all together it will be brief. But he is here to become aware of the infinity of his own inner life. He is here to know that a divine power lives in him. And that this divine power is crucified every time he corrupts himself. That it is necessary for him, therefore, to protect this being within him from that personality which is indeed a holy sepulcher from which that being must rise triumphant through the accomplishment of discipline and integration and illumination. Now illumination is a term in religion which has many meanings. Uh, some consider illumination to be a form of clairvoyance or second sight. Some consider illumination to be a mystical experience involving values completely out of this world. Some regard it as the highest possible experience of, relig of religious values. But illumination, what it is finally and all summed up, is the complete acceptance and realization that our destiny is in our own hands. Its illumination is the realization that the path that we should follow is the path which will bring us in the end to reunion and identity with the divine being. That illumination is the revelation of our own need and how it can be solved. It is the statement of an internal presence which breaks through for a moment and gives us a message that we must never forget. Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, said that he had illumination for only a few seconds twice during his lifetime but that these two or three seconds of really internal, fully comprehension of the entire pattern of things became so important that they could never be forgotten and nothing could ever be done contrary to them because there was the inevitable stamp of eternity upon them. And in the presence of that, all earthly uh, pressures instantly faded away. 
the uh, person starting out now with the hope of improving health can start with little ordinary things, a little greater integrities, a little greater sincerities. Uh, sincerity is the most powerful force. When the individual is totally sincere, he is t seldom completely wrong. He is always trying to do something better. Sincerity is lack of ulterior motive. An ulterior motive is one of the deadliest of the sins. If we have all kinds of little corruptions floating around in our natures, we're going to have heartaches, headaches, we're going to have high blood pressure, we're going to have all kinds of things, because these attitudes actually damage the little cells and lives within ourselves. The human body is a strange magnetic field. It is a field of infinite life in motion. The human body is a, a field for a great magnetic sphere which surrounds it. The human body is tied to all of its parts by magnetic pressures and uh, by attitudes. The magnetic field is in many colors. And as you study the situation very carefully, you make some interesting discoveries. With every mood that the individual has, the colors of the magnetic field change. They can be the colors of rainbows. They can be beautiful shades. Or if the individual is jealous and, or nagging or combative, a dirty mad colors come in, dull, uh, unpleasant, storm-like appearances. And in this magnetic field, as in a small universe, great thunderstorms can arise, lightning can flash, torments, uh, torrents and torments spring up. The purgatory seems to flare in the very atmosphere. All of these things are the result of the individual misusing his own abilities and powers. The magnetic field is a kind of psychic thermometer which tells how near the truth he is. And wherever there is a departure from truth, these magnetic currents are disturbed. And wherever they are disturbed, organs are disturbed, particularly the endocrine system. And where the endocrine system is disturbed, the, all the physical functions become disturbed, disordered, and sick. Therefore, an individual who is wrong is bound to be sick at something. He is bad mentally sick, emotionally sick, physically sick, psychologically sick. He is either healthy because he is right or unhealthy because he is wrong. Uh, the uh, great problems of life come as uh, we don't always quite understand a statement that we did in the Bible, namely that it is not that which goeth in at the mouth, but that which cometh out of the mouth that defileth a man. It sounds as though by best dietitians it should be the opposite, but it is right because that which comes to us from the inside from the, uh, from the outside is not our problem. It is something which would meet with the best that we have. But what comes out of ourselves, in the, out of our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our thoughts, these things, if they are wrong, they are the things which destroy or damage the human being. Every unkind word that is spoken to us is carried by someone but not by us. But every one unpleasant or destructive word we pronounce is ours, and we must live with it until we transmute it. And the great alchemy of life, to my mind, is the power to transmute the inabilities and incompletenesses and the infirmities of ourselves into eternal assets. This transformation is the regeneration of the individual. This was the great secret of mysticism. This was the secret work of the Rosicrucians and the alchemists and all of the ancient secret societies. Everything had to do with the individual gaining the power to discipline himself, to rise above his own weaknesses, and to become a living image of truth in a world disordered. And if we do this, we have the natural compensation. We, define, we find that we are allowed to face life in an entirely different way. 
And no matter what happens, happy or unhappy, we will face it. And we'll find in the end a joy that can never be found from a mistake. Now we watch the economic and political processes going around us today. They are rather pathetic. They are tiresome. They are wearisome. They frighten us. And we don't know what's going to happen next. But actually, the person who is integrated, who is really at peace with themselves, who lives in a realization of the presence of the divine in all things that happens, is able to realize that he should not forget the presence of the divine in the things he doesn't like. It is easy enough to think that if to think that if all people have dwell, developed and in peace and served each other nobly and generously and kindly, that then we would have the utopia, and that anything less than that is something that we have to accept as a terrible thing. Actually, the things that happen to us are not terrible things; they are merely our own birds coming home to roost. They are the things we have done returning to us. When we stop causing trouble, trouble stops. But this uh, trouble that we have is a great inspiration to get over it. In the last two or three years, there has been m more movement towards individuals taking on the responsibilities of life. There are more efforts to find peace, not by law, but by people gathering in contemplative integrity. There are more efforts to reform education. There are new attitudes toward law, to science, and to philosophy. And philosophy, which for the last decade or two has been very moribund, is apt to come to life again. We don't have much in philosophy because it is nearly all in the field of experimental thinking. But the old classic works are coming back. I have noticed in catalogs that books that have been out of print, very valuable books, that have been out of print for a hundred years, are now coming back for the dozens. Everyone is beginning to be interested in the thinking and the deep believing, the loving, the hoping of the, of the great world family. And that uh, modern reading with its very tempestuous iconoclasm is of no value to us in our needs. What we need is to find our roots again in the wisdom literature of our race and find in all the things that we do everything that is inspiring and clinging to it. Actually, in this field of thinking, of constructive reorganization, there is a tremendous increase. And every bombing, every massacre is bringing the day of wisdom closer. And as Krishna at the Battle of Karachitra in India, and he appeared to the charioteer Arjuna, the Prince of Men, uh, Arjuna said, How shall it be that I can go and make war to my own family? For I see the army drawn up in my own family. They are waiting to attack me, and I am waiting to attack them. And Krishna appeared in a vision at that moment and reminded the young prince, he said, Do not fear. Never the living can die. Nothing can be anything but change. No one will ever kill anyone. It is all a great dream world, a world of physical fa factors which we have made real. When the great world of beauty that we should have made been making real has been ignored. All these things that are happening are dreams. Those who die in battle will live in peace. Those who do all these things will rise again, wiser, a little better, a little more noble, a little more unselfish. And that these things are all shadows, phantoms, passing, the inevitable consequences of man's inhumanity to man. But out of it all will rise the one great humanity acceptable to God. All these things we have to face, but in daily life most of us do not face the worst of it. But we can worry about the worst of it. But the most important thing is not to worry, but to make sure 
that in our personal actions, in our personal thoughts and attitudes, we see the truth, we believe in the truth, we decide to live the truth, and we have not a hope based upon phantoms, but an absolute certainty that in the great plan of things, everything works together for good. Out of all the confusion, the chaos, the suffering, and the pain comes a great solution, and it is for that reason that we were created. We were created to grow and to finally become conscious of our divine birthright and conscious of our place in an infinite plan that is governed not only by the wisdom of God, but by the love of man to man and the truth that we hope gradually to make manifest. The whole thing is not one to get all sick and sad about. It is the, it, the uh, thing that we must accept and transmute ourselves into the realization that we are in a universe that is not the object and subject of infinite human vicissitudes, but that man ultimately must follow the path that was his in the beginning. Out of this great materialistic urge for success has come a great disaster. And it will continue as long as man puts the wrong things first. But when he realizes the facts of things, when he realizes the truth, he will ascend to be greater than the angels. He is here to learn, but it must be the hard way because it is constantly fighting his own negative uh, inherited dispositional trend, trends and characteristics. But if you want to be healthy, you want to get over the pressures of the time, you must take a larger look and see beyond all the tyrannies of human relationship the magnificent and eternal love of God for everything that lives. For all of this is going together to bring about this golden time we look for, a time which will be better than anything we have ever known. But each of us must wake up as individuals and begin to understand and see what it's all about. Well, thank you very much.